Kip, what's up, man? Great to see you. It looks like you got the Order of Man uniform on today. We are we are matching black shirt, black hats. This is how we roll. Dude. Yeah, it was good today. Actually, uh, literally, I wore this shirt at the gym, and I had like three guys like, that's a sweet shirt. Is that an apparel line? I'm like, yeah, it is. And it's a podcast. I'm like, what? And then I actually screwed up my entire morning because I ended up talking about Order of Man, the podcast, for about 30 minutes, messed up my workout, got home late. It's really all your fault. You know what? I'm tired of this shit. Sounds like it was a, a better a better day than it could have been otherwise because you wore that shirt yeah. to me. Well, cool, man. Should we get into questions for today? Because we're on a, yeah. on a on a tight timeline, and I want to make sure we can get through as many as we can. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're fielding questions today from the Facebook to join us on Facebook and our group there. Go to facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Also, the guys Ready? need to be aware we're opening up the Iron Council on the 15th. So that's Thursday, I believe. So we're opening that up. Yeah, Thursday. And that will be only open for roughly about two weeks. So yep. if you guys are on the fence, you need to execute because it's going to close after those two weeks. And you're going to have to wait until actually after the later this year. Right. That's right. We're looking at fourth quarter at this moment. Yeah, it'll be the I'm end slime. of December. Cool. All right. Let's get yep. into some questions. All right. First question, Mike Collins. How do you lead and guide a conversation, whether it's like your wife or other individuals? that doesn't have the capacity to have a serious conversation without running from them. So like, how do you okay. have a serious conversation with someone that has a tendency to run from them? It sounds like. Yeah. I have people in my life who don't like having conversations, um, especially as, as they're serious conversations. I, I personally process my thoughts and what I'm going through by talking so having these conversations has never been a difficult thing for me. But when you have somebody who processes things internally versus externally, like I do, uh, that can be a bit of a challenge for sure. And yeah. it can be frustrating. And here's the thing I've noticed as frustrating as it is for me, it's frustrating for the other party too. And we have to remember mm -hmm. that. I think that's the, that's one of the things that I really strive to remember. And I haven't always been great at this and I'm still not great at this is that if I'm frustrated about the communication between me and the other party, the other party's just as frustrated about it. Totally. Because if I'm pushing to have a conversation and that party doesn't want to, then they're not getting their way. If, if, if I, or you're if dictating not talking, the conversation, maybe. Yeah. Right. You're manipulating, forcing, coercing. If they're not talking and I'm not able to talk, then I'm not getting my way. <laughs> this is the challenge. A couple of things that I've used that have worked in the past is number one, think about how you respond when you're having conversations. If you've trained people to hate talking to you, then don't be surprised that they don't talk to you. And I'm really good at making people not enjoy talking with me because I dominate conversations. I, I um, interject my miserable. own opinion. It is, I know. I interject my own opinions and thoughts when they're not wanted or needed. Um, I, I correct, you know, even, even if it's unsolicited feedback, I might even get upset and resort to bullying tactics. So we train people the, w the way they communicate with us. And some of us, myself included, train people not to communicate with us. So that's number one. Think about the way. Now, if, if your spouse, I think you said in this case, if she does open up in some way to you, then be very aware of what you're doing and what you're saying so that next time she'll open up maybe just a bit more or she'll yeah. close and not a bit more close up what you do. Yeah. Based yeah. upon how you reacted. Yeah. Right. So that's one. Uh, number two, another thing I've noticed for people who don't want to communicate about these types of things because they process internally is give them some time. You know, for me, I'm very intuitive. Uh, I'm I'm a pretty good speaker. I'm fairly well spoken. I can articulate my thoughts fairly well because what's wrong? You got something wrong with your your milk there or something? <laughs> so I went to go drink it and I had the lid on. Oh, That's okay. how my mornings go. <laughs> I'm all uh, it's not coming out, moron. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So I'm pretty intuitive and pretty in tune with the way I'm feeling about things. That's my personality. So I will talk anytime, any day, any night, whatever, at any moment, I will talk. <clears throat> you know that. Um, yep. But other people aren't like that. Not everybody's like that. So sometimes it's giving them time to brace themselves or prepare themselves mentally or emotionally. So it might be, 
Hey, Kip, I would like to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. When's a good time for you? And then, then it's on your terms. You're like, Hey, I can't do it yeah. today for whatever reason. And your reason doesn't matter. Maybe it's your reason might be you're just busy or it might be, you don't want to have that conversation today. So you might say, Hey, I can't today, but Wednesday at noon would be really good. Cool. Then you're letting it be on their terms and they're going to be more yeah. open and receptive. Another thing that's been helpful is letting people know what you want to talk about so they can process it before you talk about it. Because I've noticed with people who process things internally, um, they they don't want to be caught and stuck in the moment. So if you could if if you could go to that person again, this could apply to a spouse or a colleague or coworker, whoever, and say, "Hey, I would like to talk with you about some things. These are the three or four things I wanted to go through with you, and just here's some just minor concerns that I have, and just some thoughts that I have about it." I wanted to share that with you, but when's a good time to talk with you? Now they can start processing what you're going to go through. They can start thinking about their thoughts. I've even written notes or letters about my feelings or something I want to express. And I've given this to somebody or an email, given this to somebody. That way they could cool. process it better. They could process it all. And then two days down the yeah. road, when we talk about it, it's like, okay, cool. Like, here's what I want to, here's what he had said. Here's what I think about it. And now we can have a more productive conversation than somebody feeling. Cause look, if you, if they feel like they're backed into a corner, it's just not going to go well. It never does. Yeah. It never does. So I, I would say, realize that not everybody's like you. Uh, they don't process things the way you probably do based on your question and c consider how you condition them to communicate with you. And then also give them time to process before like, so it doesn't feel like you're springing something and are attacking them, which you're not, totally. but for high achievers, it could, it could really be misinterpreted that way. Totally. Totally. I actually have an example. And I think, I think this example falls into a few of the recommendations that you gave Ryan. And so maybe it might help Mike a little bit just to share this. So I had a conversation that I would put in the category of an uncomfortable conversation. Like, at least that's how I was feeling coming into it. It was kind of something that I didn't want to do. I felt like, oh, oh man, like, but it needs to be ha had. Y you know what I mean? So there's a level of uncomfort on my part. Back to your point. Thus, I could probably suggest that they were equally uncomfortable about having this conversation. And the approach that I took is kind of took the seriousness out of it. Not that I like approached the conversation from a joking perspective, but I really like, try not to stonewall or bulldoze anything. Mm. And I really left it as an open mic of, Hey, I wanted to share something that's on my mind. I don't know the solution. And of course, I'm not trying to coerce you into changing anything that you're doing. Right. Like I, I don't want to take away, I didn't use these terms, but I was expressing that I'm not going to take away their freedom, right? Their, their freedom to do what they want. I might have some requests of them, but it's their call. But I wanted to let them know how I'm perceiving a, a current situation and, and see what they would like to do with it. Or we could discuss what is best for both of us moving forward. And, and then that way, it wasn't really threatening. It wasn't like, hey, something's wrong, you're wrong or whatever. It was really just me expressing the current circumstance and how I'm perceiving things and then letting them decide ultimately like how they would want to handle it. And I, and I really try to eliminate as much as possible in the language that I use that I'm not right. They're not wrong. It's not any of that. It's just me expressing a percep a perspective that I had on situation and, and I tied it to making sure that I was having some empathy because I wanted to get this on their radar because I didn't want them to go down a path that would cause discomfort for them in the future. You know, because I'm, we may not have alignment. So I wanted to let you know what my strategy is moving forward. So then that way you're not wasting your time or you don't get frustrated later on. And so it was really from a position of caring that I had the conversation and I tried to eliminate any form of judgment. I like that. I would just throw one caveat into this. And you yeah. said it comes from the position of care. Guys, we actually have to care. This is not a tactic. Like it has to be genuine. Yeah. Right. It's like, well, you know, I care about, and so you say all these clever words, I've got a silver tongue. I can talk my way into and out of anything. 
And, and so I can use a lot of these tactics and I have not for good, but to manipulate other people. So you actually oh. have to care. That actually leads into the other point that I wanted to make in addition to what you just said is sometimes just asking good, solid questions is enough. And again, it's not to lead. You're not asking to yeah. lead them to a place you Manipulate want to go. Manipulate or whatever. Right. Yeah. You're asking them because you care about the answer to the question that you're asking. So totally. let's not let's not be too strategic about this or too ta- let's not be too tactical about it. Just totally care about people, ask good questions, think about how you've conditioned them to respond and pay them that respect to not spring things on them, especially if you look. I have so much room to go in this department, but that that's been helpful as I've implemented it. Well, what's great, Ryan, just to, to put weight to what you said, originally it was tactic, right? When I thought about it, I thought, oh, well, you know, what angle? And then yeah. I, it, it forced me to get present. I was like, no, actually what's, what is caring? Like I really got present to caring. And then the conversation wasn't hard anymore. Like right. I actually leading up to that call, I wasn't stressed out at all. Because I really thought about how do I approach this from an area of empathy and having an outward mindset. And then it wasn't uncomfortable because then it was rooted from the right place. And so I would challenge us that too. And I even said this to some of my team members, you know, if, if you're about to have a conversation with an employee and you feel uncomfortable, there's a high probability that you're placing judgment and you're not taking extreme ownership and there's a lack of empathy. If you're not stressed out about it, you're probably approaching it correctly. And so, but my point being is I was able to get myself in that mindset and have the conversation to your point correctly, even though originally it was, <laughs> it was a little bit about manipulation and, and judgment and lack of empathy. But once I really dived into it, I wasn't having a hard time having the phone call once it started because I got my mind right. And you had that care for other people. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. What's next? And I just really just made that all up so I don't sound bad. I'm, I'm just joking. I, I, I promise it was genuine. <laughs> if you okay. have to say, I promise it's I'm genuine, you're not genuine. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Next uh, question. Aaron uh, Jambly, what advice and insights would you guys give to a soon to be father? Is there anything you would have done differently as a new dad looking back? Uh, yeah, there's things I would have done as a new dad looking back. I would have been way more supportive to my wife. I I kind of feel like I took a hands-off approach when when the kids were younger and I would be like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And, you know, yeah, I can't kid, breastfeed. So kids nursing. Yeah. And so um, yeah. and it really wasn't until my kids got older that I actually started to get more involved, like physically, mentally, emotionally with them. And I think that's pretty typical for men. Uh, but yeah, if I were to do it all over again, yeah, I would have been way more supportive to my wife. I would have, um, been more empathetic to what she was going through. I would have made some more sacrifices on my part, probably would have scaled back, uh, work to the degree that I could, so I could be more present. Um, I would have been way more helpful around the house. Um, and yeah, maybe some chores and things around the house or some errands that needed to be run, but I would have also made sure that I didn't become another child, like leave my dirty underwear laying on the bed uh, or leaving a mess in the bathroom. Uh, you know, maybe I drive her car every once in a while and fill up the tank so that she didn't have to stop and go get gas. Like there's so many things I would have done differently. And even now I'm thinking like, what are the things I can do differently to help support around here? Uh, yeah. I think we just need to be more empathetic and, get, get away from the, well, you know, it's not really my kid until it's four or five and they can throw a football, which is kind of my, was my mentality. And yeah, I really wish I would have done that differently. Yeah. It's very easy to, to latch onto this. Well, they're a baby and they're so attached to mom. So, you know, it's really easy to throw your hands up in those early years. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So I just be more, there's nothing I would add. I just, I, me too. Yeah. 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 In fact, you're making me feel bad right now. As I think, (laughs) as I think back, like the gas thing, I was like, "Damn, that's a good idea." I I even even cross my mind. There are so many doing that stuff now. Now, (laughs) I mean, there are so many little opportunities if you just look for a second. And look, I've overlooked so many opportunities. But um, my wife, the other day, we were outside with some friends, and and everybody was over celebrating my daughter's birthday, and there's this little 
trumpet vine that grows up the side of her garage. And I put some trellis on there. So those vines can grow up through those trellises and it, it grown so much. It kind of grew to the top of that trellis. And, and my wife said, Oh man, it's like, we need another trellis here. It's grown so long. And we don't, I want it to keep growing. He's very, very casually, very nonchalant said it. And I, it took me 30 minutes, man. Like just third on there. Yeah. 30 minutes. You know, I, I, ha I went downstairs in the barn. I'm like, man, I think we still have some extra left over. cut a piece real quick, screwed it onto the, the wall, wove some in there, killed some of the vines, unfortunately, while I did it, but wove it through the thing. It's like, took me 30 minutes. Like we, we can all do a better job at that. I I've, I've really failed in that department. So I'm trying to do better in, in the, and we think sometimes that, Oh, it's not a big deal. Um, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm too busy with work. I don't have time for this stuff. Well, you know, yeah, you can tell yourself that for sure. Or, or another one is, um, the kids had like these little, uh, 360 power bikes and one of the bars was bent. And so I just went and I turned it over and I bent the bar back the kid. Cause the kids were asking me if I would do that you know, six months ago, a year ago, I probably been like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And like never got around to it, but I literally just turned the thing over and bent it back into place. It took me 27 seconds. It's like, just do it. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. I got a, I got a little, uh, what's the look like a little razor scooter bike in the uh -huh. garage that my daughter keeps reminding me that the batteries need to be replaced. I think I've told her about six months that I was going to fix that. <laughs> Yeah, man. Either so, uh, either, either fix it or well, fix it because you said you would. But so, either fix yeah. it or just stop saying you'll do things. You know, like my my oldest son came to me okay. uh, today and he's like, "Hey, man, hey, dad, when can we go pick up these RTDs? It's the new protein shake from from Origin. Can we go pick these up today?" And normally, I would say, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we'll do it." Knowing that I'm busy, knowing that we may or may not get to it, but today I was like. Hey, bud, like, I don't know if we're going to get to it today. I will try. And if I do, it'll be in this time frame. but I can't make that guarantee, but we'll do it this week because I, I want to be an in integrity. Yeah. I want to be I'm honest. Yeah. yeah. And if I'm not going to do it or don't think I can, or don't have the time it's yeah. It might be disappointing that we can't go do that thing, but it's more disappointing to say yes and then not do it. So those are things I'm working yeah. on. Yeah. And trust, right? Trust gets affected when we do that as well. Completely. Completely. All right, Mr. Paul Beam. It's been a while, Paul. Um, I enjoy take, uh, I enjoy talking to others. I'm an open book as a business owner. I especially have had a hard time stopping when I get to talking about my business. I'm excited. How do you regulate how much time you spend in conversations with others? Kind of feedback. Yeah, you you got to look for cues from other people. If the the typical oh, that's great. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you start hearing that over and over again. It means time to shut up. If they say, Hey, I got to go do this thing, like honor that and respect that they have to go do that thing. If you notice their eyes glazing over, in fact, just don't even talk about yourself. Just talk about them. No, nobody really cares about what you do. Like that's the reality. Nobody cares. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know what Paul, what your business is. I should know. Cause I think we've been connected for a long time. Um, is, so does he do men's work as well? I think it was right, two Paul, Paul in like the tech space. Was it okay. in the tech space? And he nobody was doing cares. Like social... Okay. Nobody cares. <laughs> like nobody, especially cares. if it's the tech space, <laughs> nobody cares about men's work either. Like when, when people ask me what I do, I say, oh, we have a men's leadership development organization. Like I don't, unless they ask another question, like, oh, what do you mean? I might explain that, but nobody cares. Cause then there's some interest. Yeah. Right. So I, and I don't want to talk about it with somebody that doesn't care because they have things yeah. to do. I have things to do. So just knock it off. Just stop talking about yourself because nobody cares about it anyways. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting about this, Ryan, and I'm sure you, you can think of some people that are this way. And, and I love these guys. Like I, I have these guys on my hand. I can actually like name them. I won't blast them here. I love being around them. They're an amazing people, but they love to talk. And I love the conversation, but because whenever I hang out with them, it's never an hour, it's two or three hours. 
it's we're up all night. It's I'm now going to be late to the whatever the next thing is because I happen to hang out or go grab lunch with them. The next time they call me up and say, hey, Kip, let's go have lunch. I'm a little bit like, uh, it's not like they are going to have a hard time respecting my time. And it's and it's like pain in the butt to go engage because it always takes longer, unfortunately. And I have other priorities. So kind of it affects your relationships is ultimately what I'm trying to say is Absolutely. it's not just about listening to them, but other people may not want to hang out with you as much, right? If you're talking all the time and you're eating up their time and affecting their schedules in a negative way. So just Agreed. kind of realize the impact. I would take issue with one thing you said, they're not respecting your time. I would actually flip that on its head well, and say, you're not respecting your own time. Yeah. So yeah, if you have totally. somebody like that, and this flips the question a little bit from, from what it was, but if you have a this situation is, this like is that. This is the question, how to deal with Paul. <laughs> right, right. So let's so, address it from yeah. this angle. <laughs> you you got to prep people ahead of time. So So if it's your buddies, you might say, hey guys, yeah, I can go out and get wings with you, but I got to leave at 10 because I have this thing. And then when 10 rolls around, actually I would do yeah, it at yeah. about 945. Hey guys, just so you know, I'm out of here in, in 15 minutes. I'm out of here in 10 minutes. I'm out of here in five minutes. And then you actually have to leave at the right time. We do this with our kids. I, I noticed if I go to my kids and I say, hey guys, it's bedtime. They always put up a stink. I don't want to do that. We're not tired. I don't want to watch the rest of this show. I want to. It's like always a fight. But if yeah. I go to him and I say, "Hey guys, bedtime's in a half hour." Ten. Yep. Yep. And then when it get, then I do the ten minute warning and the five minute warning and the two minute warning, and I'm like, "Hey, two minutes." And then when it's done, or hey, at you know eight thirty, it's bedtime. When that clock strikes eight thirty, that seems to be better. So not that they don't always totally. not put up a stink. Still, they still do to a degree but that works better. So set those boundaries yeah. and communications uh, up front. That helps. Yeah. My kids are great from that perspective. Like we can be in, I don't know, Playland in Carl's Jr. Or whatever. And I'm like, you got 10 minutes. And literally I'm like, all right, it's time to go. They're all like, they go. Yep. Right. It's super nice. But to your point, if I said it's time to go now, it'd be like, no, I don't want it just you know, it's doesn't like work. <laughs> doesn't work. Yeah. All right, cool. What's next? All right. Greg Fisher. Actually, hold on. One what? other thing on that, yeah. Kip. Yeah. So some of you guys might say about that last question about talking about ourselves and what we do, that that's rich or ironic coming from us as we're talking about ourselves. Uh, <laughs> All the, the time. Dif yeah. The difference is you're, you volunteered to be here and you're asking us questions. Okay. So that I bring that up because if somebody's asking you a question about something, then yeah, the, sure. Then share. Yeah. Right. That's your opportunity or they're asking for feedback. That's your opportunity, but don't overdo it because if you overdo it, then they're never going to ask you again. So look for those cues. Yeah. Well, and, and it goes back to, I have to say, it goes back to what you're saying earlier, right? The best way that I can have a conversation with you, Ryan, is me walking away with, man, Ryan was really interested in what I had to say. And I got to talk a lot. Yeah. I think those went well, like the best interviews. And I know this of me, I have to like fight this. The best interviews when I interview a new candidate, I was talking the whole time <laughs> and I was like, that interview went great. And I thought, wait a second, it only went great because I just ran my mouth the whole time and they nodded. I'm like, damn it. I need to change that, you know, because by natural tendency is I got to share my opinion and they agreed and it makes me feel good. So right. like be mindful of that. Yeah. All right. Greg Fisher. What tips do you have for guiding teens through social media and social apps when they get pressure from their friends? We are conservative when allowing them to have an account, but know that they are growing up in a different world we grew up in. Uh, I'm not really there too much, uh, except for my oldest son, who's 14. Uh, and he, yeah, he's got an Instagram account, but it's not on his phone. It's link to my Instagram account. So he can pull it up on mom's phone or he can pull it up on my phone. And, um, my wife has actually done a really good job setting boundaries. So he'll, he'll go, I've noticed he'll go to her and say, Hey, can I have my first time on, on, on Instagram? And he'll have his time and he knows what it is. And the boundaries communicated clearly. And that's it. Uh, he yeah. has a phone and my second son, who's, uh, almost 11 has, has a phone as well. Um, and he 
it's just a, it's called a gab phone. So they can call, they we can have text gabs as well. Yeah. They can get pictures. They can't get video, but they can receive and send pictures. And then also they don't take phones upstairs at night. They stay charged downstairs and we can pull them up on an app. We can look at them on, on, on the, the counter. So those are available. Uh, but yeah, outside of that, I mean, people often complain about their kids and technology or it's, it's like, well, how did they get that phone? Well, you bought it for them. Why are they watching so much TV? Because it's your TV and you have all the subscriptions and you've given them access to everything. Like you're the parent. So if you're upset about how your kids are behaving or engaged or what behaviors they're engaged in, ask yourself how they got addicted to those behaviors in, in the first place. And yeah, they're going to get pressure from their friends. Like, oh, you're not on Snapchat. I don't even know if people use Snapchat, but I think kids still use Snapchat. It's like, oh, you're not on Snapchat. Oh, you need to be there. Oh, this and that. Well, explain to your kids why you don't want them on that. And I don't think social media is, well, it's going to say it's not inherently bad. I actually think it is inherently bad, but it can be used for good. And if you explain to them how to use that tool effectively, then they're going to get it. And also, how, how do you behave? Like, how often are you on your phone? How often are you on social media? What are you doing on social media when you maybe should be present? That's one thing I've really tried to do. I've, I've been largely off social media for the last month and a half or so. And it's been kind of nice, actually. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't get dragged into bull crap. I don't, I don't like bicker with people that don't know me or I don't know them or argue about things that are unimportant. Uh, it's been pretty refreshing. So what behavior are you modeling as well? Yeah. Good call. We're the same. We have gabs. We have the watches for the girls, which they can't even receive photos and they can only text like five people. Right. But as an example, like my daughter, that's 11. She's a little bit in this space where she's like, dad, I, you know, I kind of want a phone, you know, my friends have a phone. I have this kid watch, you know, she's like a little embarrassed because she thinks it looks like a, a ch it's like what the little kids use, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. But we've been communicating with her for years about, hey, you're not getting these certain things. We're not doing. So it, it kind of goes back to what you're saying earlier, establishing the boundary, boundaries early on, letting our kids know like, hey, it, we're going to go in five. For those with younger kids, let your kids know how this is going to play out right? right? like right. ahead of time. So they can start kind of processing it, knowing that yet yeah, you, you're not going to have TikTok, period, right? Like. And, and a guarantee that's how it's going to go in our home. Our daughters will never have that app on their devices, period. Now they can, when they go to 18 and go to college or whatever, sure. But that's not going to be an option for them. And I'm, they know that already. And one of them's only nine. And she already knows that that's not going to be an option for them. So, you know, communicate ahead of time, give them time to process. Um, that's the only other thing I'd add. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I like you has how have you guys liked that gab watch it's, or the gab phone has that been working well yeah i mean we don't know any different that's all we've ever had but it seems to be working pretty well for the kid i mean they can text and talk and call and, and communicate yeah. yeah and you know maybe they'll put up a stink occasionally that they don't have whatever they actually don't now that i think of it they don't really complain that they don't have the thing because it's just the standard and that's just what it is yeah yeah i like it um and i also like your guys's phones get charged downstairs. Uh, we did right. that with our older boys, like all devices plugged into the kitchen. We yep. were super inconsistent with it. Hopefully we'll do a better job at these with the younger batch is what we call them. <laughs> uh, round two. All right. Uh, sorry. I wasn't prepping the next question. Um, That's okay. I got, you sucked me into your I response did. so much I that did. I wasn't ready. All right. Chris Moore. I just transitioned to a new job from a well-established company to one that, although quite large, lacks a lot of foundation, structure, and process that I'm used to. My hiring manager was moved to a new role the week before I started, and, and we have now been folded into an even larger parent company. I currently feel very overwhelmed and question my decision uh, of starting this new role. But I do see a lot of potential and opportunity to make my mark. Any tips or things I can do to navigate the next year in this role? How do I tell if it's time to cut bait and bell if things are not progressing in a positive way? Yeah, I think you're premature on that. I mean, everything that you talked about sounds like a cool opportunity. Well, it sounds like a cool opportunity. 
You know, you have this company that, that just got folded into another company. So some of that support and stuff might be coming in. That's not there. So you might be getting some yeah. of that. Um, also there's opportunities for you to assert yourself and say, Hey, you know, here's something that we had at this other organization and here's what we might do to, to create some, some unity or cohesiveness amongst the team members, what, whatever. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities in those gaps, like you said, Kip. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, I'd be careful of jumping right to, Hey, how do I know when it's time to jump ship? Like there's nothing that I heard you say that makes me think, Oh boy, you're in trouble. I just, well, and all the stuff that he said is all perceived, right? It's not true. Right. It's like this unstableness is like, well, maybe, maybe not. Right. Like, yeah. Too early. Yeah. And, and it might just be that you're uncomfortable with something new. The unknown. It might, yeah. it might be that there actually is systems in place, but they're not your comfortable systems. It would be like, I don't know, go, going to do uh let, let, let's say you've been working with a, a fitness coach and you've been working with him for five years and you're used to his, his movements. You're used to his workouts. You're used to his programming and his tempo. You're used to all of this stuff. And then you decide for whatever reason, you're going to go over to this other uh, new uh, fitness coach. And, and now all of a sudden, he's got new moves and the tempo and pace is different. And some of the naming of, of the, the workouts are different and it's not less organized. It's just different. And so it feels chaotic until you start to get your feet under you a little bit. So to your point, is that objectively true? Maybe also maybe not. So look, just, just go in it with an open mind. See if there actually is a systems in place. See if the way they do things is better. Maybe it's better. Maybe it's not, but I think you can have an open mind about it right now, especially where you're in early stages and you don't really need to ask like, when's the right time to tuck tail. I, I think you, I think you'll kind of know. And I, I just don't think you're there yet. Yeah. Any tips, you know, the kind of the root question was kind of tips to navigate the next year, maybe not so much bell, but like maybe take advantage of these potential opportunities. Any recommendations there? I mean, first look for them. You know, if you're, if you're already thinking about well, when do I bail, you're probably not looking for all the opportunities that are there. There's a lot of little places and all the nooks and crannies that you can look for opportunities to, to serve or to help or to step up or to create or to add value. So look, look for those things. And then, like I said, just be open-minded to the way they do things. Uh, and, and especially when it comes to the merging with another, maybe a parent company, like you had suggested, uh, they may come in and want to clean house and who, who are they going to clean house with? Uh, certainly not the people that are open-minded and adding value and can see that they're ready for something bigger and greater, but they will consider those who are closed minded and have their, their own way of doing things. So be open to that. And then just, just flow like Kip, you're really good when it comes to jujitsu of just like flowing. All right. You take what somebody gives you and you take it and you run with it. And and if it closes off, then you abandon it. Like you don't keep with it. Like if, if yeah. you and I are, are rolling and I give up my arm accidentally, you, you grab my arm. If I get it back into a position where it's safe, like you don't hang on to it. You let go yeah. of it. You're like, okay, well that means maybe now his leg is open. So I'm going to attack the leg. So just flow, just flow. Yeah. Just roll with the punches. Flow. And I love that you're training, man. And we can make jujitsu references to so everything. Good. It's so, so great. Good. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that comes to mind, you know, it's a new company, right? And and I, I've done this a couple of times where I'm the new guy and I've been hesitant and very slow to just jump in and go, whoa, this is broken. I'm going to fix stuff. And, and so there's a little bit of a balance there. One thought I'd have is, over communicate that stuff, right? So if you see it, a potential opportunity of a gap or a problem, like, hey, Ryan, I see this gap in what we're currently doing today. I would love to step in and come up with a potential resolve. You good if I come up with something or I've given some thought and here's an idea to this gap. That way you can ensure that there's a gap. You're not stepping on like maybe someone's already addressed it or maybe there's more that you didn't see. So just overly communicate kind of some of your ideas and thoughts that will help get some buy-in, but also make sure that you're not executing on some island. And then everyone's like, what the hell, man? Like we already have this process and here you are going off on your own thing and not being a team player. So just make sure that you're communicating what you're working on, communicate those steps. And I also want to get credit for it, right? So if, if I... 
find a gap and I fix a solution. I want to tell Ryan, I, I fixed that, man. Oh, hey, I took care of this and this is what I'm doing so I can get some credit from the boss. And he's like, oh man, thank you. I appreciate that because you, you may not get credit, right? If you're addressing things. And so make sure you're communicating those as well. The only exception to that, Kip, is if it's taken to the extreme, you might actually create more problems than you solve. So I can think of this in a, a couple different contexts. Uh, it might cost more money for you to implement your solution. Well, if we're on a budget that you're not aware of and you're proposing all these solutions that are going to cost more money, you're just going to piss me off. Now you're a pain in my side. Yeah. Right. Uh, or if you need to, you need other assets, whether that's certain technology or other people and move them over to this department to solve problems. Okay. Well, maybe I have those people there for a reason and I can't do with that technology, or I've got my head down as the supervisor or team leader on a specific task. So be observant mm -hmm. because the last thing you want to do is create work. I'll give you a very small example of how people do that with me. And while I appreciate the sentiment, I want you to know how it comes across. If you message me, email, message, whatever, and you say to me, hey, Ryan, I really like your movement. I love what you're doing. And I would love to work with you. Is there a way that I can help you? I really, really appreciate the sentiment. That means you care about what we're doing. It means you're engaged with what we're doing. You want to be involved. You think you can add value. I appreciate the sentiment. But it's not my job to try to help you come up with a job for you in our organization. And so what you end up doing is you're actually asking me to do more for you by adding value to your life, but yet you haven't earned the right to ask me for that yet. Does this make sense, Kip, how I'm saying this? Totally, totally. A better way to do that, and I've had people do this, is where they recognize a problem and they just begin to solve, this, solve, it, solve it. So um, I'll give you a very small example. Uh, years ago when I started in my financial planning practice with, with the a digital marketing and the financial planning practice, there was a guy that I wanted to write an article for. And instead of reaching out to him and asking him what kind of article he needed and what kind of this and that and how I could help and what the parameters were, I went in and I saw his typical article length. Um, I was very familiar with him because I'd followed him. So I knew his inside jokes and the things that were quirky about him and unique and different. Uh, and I knew what topics he addressed and I knew what his channel and his, his, his lane was, but what things he hadn't addressed. And so I just went and I wrote an article. It was probably 1500 words or so, and it was relevant to his audience. <clears throat> and he was big into in and out. It's one of his favorite restaurants. So I remember putting a joke in there about in and out or, or why Jeff really likes in and out, something like that. And I just sent the article to him and I said, Hey, Jeff, uh, I really like what you do. Um, I wrote this article for you. I hope it helps. Um, it's, it's enriched for SEO search engine optimization, and it's written in a style that I think is pretty consistent with your, with your website. He published it immediately, sent me a message back. He's like, wow. He's like, this is amazing. And I, I can't remember verbatim what he said, but he said something like, you know, you, you really did your research on this. Um, and I'm very impressed with what you did. Well, he was right. Totally. I did my research and I put, I did, I, I, took work off of his plate and added value. I didn't add work to his plate. So be careful of totally. that as well. And, and I have a, even like even a more simplistic version of this. You know, oh, I've, even I've better. Reported... Oh, even you want up me oh, even better yeah. than Well, than that's mine. what I okay. meant, a better. <laughs> yeah, okay. Better let's, hear, let's hear yours, Kip. Um, <laughs> yours is probably better. So let's hear it. What's, what's way more simplistic. Actually, so I've reported to a bunch of VPs earlier on in my career. And I remember the first time I asked for uh, letter of recommendation. Guess what they said? You write it. Yep. They told me to write the letter of recommendation. Your own letter. Like, of you write the letter. Of yeah. You write the letter of recommendation. You give it to me. I'll pivot and adjust it. That way I understand what you want the letter of recommendation and you're not wasting my time. Right. Right. I don't have time to write letters of recommendation. And, and, and now I, I feel the same way. If someone said, Oh, Kip, could you write me a letter? I'm like, I don't have time to do that. You write it up. You give me the key points that you want to make sure I cover. I'll make sure it's in line with my viewpoint. Now you're good to go. I'll give you a, uh, I'll let you in on it a was little good secret. Right? That was a good, that was a good example. It was, it it was it? a great example. It was it was I'm going to one up you though, because if you one up <laughs> me, I'm going to one up you. Yep. I it's a great you. example. 
I'm going to let you in on a little, a little secret here. You know, all those fancy book blurbs that you read on people's books from other people. Yeah. yeah. Very often those are written by the author. Yeah. And the author says, goes to somebody and says, Hey, will you write a blurb or better yet? Here's three that I've written for you in yeah. your style, in your tone. Would you, would you endorse the book? And they'll say yes or no. And if they say yes, say, great, here's three, take one, take all tweak, adjust, tweak, mess with the word, whatever, and then we'll use it. So very often the book blurbs that you guys are reading from the masculinity manifesto to other New York times, bestselling books that you've read, those blurbs are largely written by authors and signed off by the people who, uh, who are endorsing the book. Yeah. Which is a perfect segue. Do you want to give an update? What is the update on, on your book? So that comes out September 27th. Very excited about that. So that's the next couple we of weeks. Pre-order, now. correct? Pre-order. Well, I pre-order on Amazon. So I'm yep. assuming wherever. Yep. Okay. Um, you can pre-order there. We'll also have a couple of uh, signed options available in the store here very shortly with a cool leather bound cover and things like that that we'll have. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, Masculinity Manifesto comes out September 27th. Let's blow that thing up. That's really what I want to do. Awesome. All right. All right do you have let's, time for uh, one more? Okay. We'll do a rapid fire on this one. Okay. Uh, Esteban Ortiz, what can I do to be an impact amongst the young men in my family? I have a sister-in-law with boys who tend to act out physically and vocally to their moms. Their dads are there, but not there. Would it be wise to try to step in and try to guide these young boys? If so, what would be a recommended way to go about this situation? Thank you. I don't think it's wise or not wise to step in. But I think if you're part of the family, then sure, sure you've got a responsibility yeah. to do that. And the best thing that you can do is to get them outside of the environment into an environment that they like. So that might be going on a hike or going for a swim or go maybe going to the car, or... car show or yeah, go grab an ice cream yeah. or take them to, to jujitsu for the first time. Uh, whatever you're engaged in, get them involved. And then you can course correct and help them along the way. So if they're in the car with you and they're back talking, then you should say, Hey guys, that stuff may fly at home, but that doesn't fly with uncle Ryan here. Like we don't talk to each other like that. Oh, and by the way, we don't talk to other family members or other people like that too. The way we talk yeah. to them is with a your mutual level. Yeah. Yes. Right. So you totally. course correct because it sounds like they're just not getting it at home. So be the example, get them out of the environment. You set the boundaries, you uphold the boundaries. Cause look, you can say things that maybe mom is not capable or unwilling to say, but then you can also help them have a better way of communicating and engaging with their mother, their family and the world in general. Yeah. And you're the fun uncle with like zero repercussions. So the probability of them listening to you is actually really high. My yeah. nephew, for instance, went to, I don't know, homecoming dance or whatever in high school. And it was funny because there's a family text and they're like, who's this girl? Oh, I thought he was liking another girl. And, and his mom replied to the group text and says, well, he listened to uncle Kip and, and is decided not to be exclusive with any girls because he's too young. Awesome. And then, and then everyone's reply to that is like, well, I've been telling him that for years. He never listens to me. You know Different. what I mean? I'm like the value of being an uncle, right? Yep. I get to say things and they may actually listen to me. Unlike their, <laughs> unlike mom and dad. So it's, it's, you know, and it's yeah. kind of a bummer when you're the mom or dad, but so what the objective is being right. met. That's great. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. So a couple call to action guys. So you got until Thursday um, to sign or not until Thursday. Iron Council opens up this Thursday. Sign up. Go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. That's going to be open for two weeks. And then you're joining us starting the fourth quarter, which means that if you don't join in that window, you're waiting until December, aka starting to the new year. Yeah, um, that's and right. Let's be frank. All of you are going to look into the fourth quarter and saying, you know what? Shit, I wasted the last year. And I'm going to, and we're, we all, not all of us, but a lot of us have a tendency to review our year, which we should be kind of doing and saying, hey, we need to get our, our asses in line and do a better job. Start today. There is no tomorrow. There's no next year. There is now. And what a great opportunity for you is to get on the path now going into the new year, going into the holiday season 
on a path of progression and not waiting and and watching life from the bleachers. Actually get on the court, join us in the Iron Council, orderofman.com slash Iron Council. And of course, connect with Mr. Mickler on the socials at Ryan Mickler. And you can get our beautiful swag from the Order of Man store, store.orderofman.com. And of course, the book, you can pre-order uh, the book on Amazon. I'm assuming uh, wherever books Amazon are sold. Amazon is best. Is that- yeah, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Amazon wherever you get your books. doesn't matter. Okay, excellent. Cool. All right, guys. Thanks for the good questions. Hopefully, we gave you some decent answers. And uh, we will be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.